It's confirmed plans to raise the retirement and re-employment ages will go ahead from July 1st next year. MP Lewis Ng is being investigated for holding up a sign in support of hawkers during a walkabout last year. ExxonMobil plans to cut 7% of its Singapore workforce, blaming unprecedented conditions resulting from the pandemic. You're watching The Big Story, coming to you live from the Straits Times newsroom. I'm Olivia Kuei. I'm Harian Tudiman and you can subscribe to the Straits Times channel so you never miss a single episode. The raising of the retirement age to 63 years old will go ahead as planned on July 1st next year, as will the re-employment age to 68. During the debate on her ministry's budget today, Manpower Minister Josephine Teo also told Parliament that the public service will fulfil its earlier commitment to raise the ages of a year ahead of legislation for its some 146,000 officers. The raising of CPF contribution rates for senior workers will also go ahead on January 1st, 2022. This will help to keep us on track to raise the retirement age to 65 and re-employment age to 70 by the end of this decade. While we are asking more of our employers, we have also provided them fair support to make these adjustments. This is why we announced a $1.3 billion senior workers support package last year. Companies that raise their retirement and re-employment ages before it becomes compulsory can apply for the senior worker early adopter grant. Many senior workers will work longer if they can do so part-time. They tell us that. Employers that provide such opportunities can apply for the part-time re-employment grant. Interest in these two grants have been high. Since they started in July last year, we have supported 1,700 companies with 17,000 senior worker beneficiaries. We will top up their budget by over $200 million to directly benefit about 75,000 seniors. But the larger goal is to create the momentum and shape a new norm among employers, where many more companies raise retirement and re-employment ages to 60, 65 and 70 well before 2030. Mrs. Teo also said today that more than six in ten hires under the Jobs Growth Incentive didn't see a drop in wages. In addition, about three in ten of the JGI hires were previously unemployed. Extended until the end of September, Mrs. Teo stressed that the scheme is one strategy to ensure locals remain employable. Without JGI lubricating the process, the movement of workers into growing firms and industries will likely be slower. A JGI extension of seven months is helpful and we will assess what is needed after September. And from May, foreigners staying here on dependence passes will need a work pass to work instead of a letter of consent. This means that employers will need to apply for an employment pass, S pass or work permit for them with the relevant qualifying salary, dependency ratio ceiling and levy applying. Mrs. Teo said this is for quote consistency with recent work pass moves. More moving on, newly arrived migrant workers in the construction, marine and process sectors can soon serve the bulk of their stay-home notice period in quick-build dormitories. Second Minister for Manpower Tan Si Ling said these dorms will serve as new migrant worker onboarding centres under a pilot programme. So from March 15th, these workers will serve SHN for four days in hotels while waiting for the results of COVID-19 tests that they have to take upon arrival in Singapore. If they clear these tests, they will be sent to these quick-built dorms to serve out the rest of their quarantine period. They will go through a residential onboarding program there, which includes an enhanced medical examination and expanded settling-in program. This enhanced medical examination program will entail a more comprehensive and rigorous screening to enable appropriate health support and interventions. For example, workers above the age of 40 or with risk factors will also be screened for chronic illnesses like diabetes, high blood pressure and high cholesterol. This enables us to 
identify these risks earlier and have a more effective, targeted downstream patient care. It also reduces potential work disruptions and unexpected medical costs for employers from untreated health conditions. The residential settling-in program will also inculcate better dormitory living and worksite practices amongst migrant workers who have just arrived here to help them understand their employment rights, the kind of good health practices and Singapore's social norms. And for instance, workers will learn to adopt the safe management measures to learn how to use contact tracing devices, safe entry check-ins, as well as the foreign worker mom care app to monitor their own temperatures, update daily health status and access telemedicine if symptoms are reported. And our guest migrant workers will learn when and how to seek help when they are unwell or when they need assistance with employment disputes. This NWOC brings together various entry processes as one efficient, seamless, integrated end-to-end -end process. Centralising, coordinating the operations and functions together also facilitates faster reaction times as well as it allows us to adapt and be able to preempt better preparation for future pandemics. It benefits employers, workers and the general community in Singapore. For employers, bringing the processes together helps to lower the risk of transmission from imported cases, enabling the entry of more migrant workers to support our businesses where they are needed. Dr Tan also announced that all dormitories will now be regulated under a single law, the Foreign Employees Dormitories Act or FIDA. This will help authorities prevent and more quickly contain disease outbreak in the dorms. All dormitories, whether regulated under FIDA or not, are subjected to a set of regulatory requirements set by the various government agencies covering areas such as building and fire safety, minimum living and hygiene standards, and FIDA imposes additional requirements in areas such as public health and safety, security and public order, and the provision of social and commercial facilities as well as services. Our experience in containing this pandemic in the dorms highlighted the need to strengthen our regulatory levers in order to enable us to raise and enforce housing standards very quickly across the various dormitory types and sizes. And to introduce new housing standards to make dormitory living more resilient to public health risks. Well, Dr Tan also said MOM will engage stakeholders in the coming months to review expanding the scope of FIDA. It hopes to complete the review and provide more details in the second half of this year. And highlighting MOM's efforts to protect the employment rights of foreign workers, Dr Tan said under the Employment of Foreign Manpower Act, employers who underpay their workers could be fined up to $10,000, jailed up to one year or both. Mr Singh asked for the details of the number of migrant workers who are unpaid and the details of the restitution made. Between 2015 and 2019, 950 errant employers were caught for not paying the foreign employees their contractual fixed monthly salary or inflating the salaries with no intention of paying them the amount that has been declared. There were about 1,400 foreign employees affected in these cases. Exploitation in any form is not fair to employees and is unacceptable. For underpayment of salaries, we will get the employers to make full restitution of salaries owed to the foreign employees. The vast majority have been able to recover their salaries in full. For willful employers, MOM will take further enforcement actions and failure to comply will attract additional penalties, including payment of fines and serving an imprisonment sentence. Underpayment of salaries to any employee, foreign or local, is not tolerated, and we will not hesitate to take actions against any errant employers and parties who abet the offence. Meanwhile, Minister of State for Manpower, Gan Xiao Huang, announced that the SG United Traineeships Program will be extended by another year to March 31, 2022. This allows the program to support the class of 2021. 
Ms. Gan also said that MOM is making some adjustments to the program. Training allowances for ITE and Polytechnic graduates will be raised, an extra boost for those having difficulties finding a job. The training allowance for ITE grads will increase by about 30%, up to a maximum of $1,800, while the raise for Poly grads will be about 20%, up to a maximum of $2,100. The traineeships are available to graduates from the private education institutes as well. Well, changes have also been made to facilitate trainees' transition into jobs. The maximum traineeship duration has been shortened from nine months to six, and companies will not be allowed to take on the same trainee for a second traineeship. Host organizations are also encouraged to hire trainees who have performed well during their stint. These changes will take effect from April the 1st. Singapore's first University of the Arts will be established by an alliance between the Nanyang Academy of Fine Arts and LaSalle College of the Arts. Education Minister Lawrence Wong said the new Umbrella University would remain private but supported by the government and both NAFA and LaSalle will continue to remain as the same colleges offering their own programmes. I've discussed with the boards and management teams in both institutions. We recognize that LaSalle and NAFA have grown from strength to strength over the years to become centers of artistic excellence with their own unique character and strengths. We want to retain these distinctive identities. At the same time, both institutions recognize the opportunity to come together and forge closer collaboration and to leverage their respective strengths and traditions. Because of the quality and standards that both LaSalle and NAFA have achieved, I'm happy to share that MOE will grant the Alliance its own degree awarding powers and also confer it university status. So this will be our first University of the Arts in Singapore. National Development Minister Desmond Lee told Parliament that the National Parks Board conducts rigorous inspections every 6 to 24 months with trees close to areas with high pedestrian or traffic activity getting more frequent checks. This regime follows the best management practices set by the International Society of Agriculture. During a tree inspection and parks, inspectors conduct a comprehensive visual inspection, a visual examination of the tree crown, branches, trunk and roots to assess the tree's health and stability. Trees that are found to have possible defects are subject to an additional in-depth inspection, which involves the use of diagnostic equipment to assess the internal condition of the tree. Since November 2016, such in-depth inspections are also conducted annually for trees of more than four metres in girth. This is a precautionary measure in response to changing weather conditions and is over and above the best management practices of the International Society of Arboriculture. Mr Lee was responding to two parliamentary questions on Ang Park's tree inspection regime after a woman was killed when a tree fell on her in Masling Park last month. He said Ang Park has other measures to reduce the risk of such incidents, including those that improve general tree health, structure and balance. In other news, four of the five injured workers from last Wednesday's Tuas Industrial Fire have been moved out from the ICU to the High Dependency Ward. Posting the update on Facebook, the Migrant Workers Centre said it received the good news from the employer. The centre's team has also contacted the workers' families and will arrange video calls with the workers as soon as possible. One worker, though, remains in critical condition. Meanwhile, Senior Minister of State for Manpower Zaki Muhammad told Parliament today that MOM will appoint an inquiry committee to look into this tragic case. It was one of the worst accidents in recent years. Our inspectors have commenced inspections on close to 500 companies that may have combustible dust hazards. And this is to ensure that risks are minimised. The Minister for Manpower will appoint an inquiry committee to thoroughly study the case and recommend prevention measures, including policy or regulatory changes if necessary. 
Nisun GRC MP Lewis Ng is currently being investigated by the police for not applying for a permit before he visited hawkers with a placard last June. Mr Ng had posted about his trip to Ishun Park Hawker Centre on Facebook back on June 20th, encouraging residents to visit the hawkers. In four pictures accompanying that post, he's seen holding up a piece of paper that read, support them with a smiley face. Mr Ng wrote on Facebook today that he was at the Hawker Centre in June last year doing his regular walkabout. He added that he had also been asked by the police to provide a statement on the matter and has done so. An update on the COVID-19 situation here. Two community cases were among the 23 new infections reported today. The remaining 21 cases were imported infections and were placed on stay-home notice when they arrived in Singapore. The Health Ministry will share more details tonight. And due to the pandemic, ExxonMobil will cut about 7% of its workforce here, equating to around 300 positions by the end of this year. All the affected staff are professionals and managers, and they will be notified between March 8th and 12th. The last day of payroll for these employees will be on April 30th. Well, yesterday we briefly covered the sad news that the substation will permanently close in July. Harianzo, do you have any uh, memories of the place? I actually do. You know, I remember uh, going there with my friends when we were younger to catch um, bands performing, yeah. local indie bands performing. And it's, it's just a nice area, right, f where, you know, all of us, we just go there in, in your younger days to so just kind of like hang out and just check out the uh, local arts scene. Mm, for sure. Well, judging by reactions that we have seen on the substation's Facebook post announcing its closure, your sentiments, you know, were echoed by many. Mm. Some talked about how the venue is an institution to the Singapore arts scene, while others reminisced about starting their artistic journey there. For example, local film director and screenwriter Kirsten Tan said she's in awe of how a single arts institute like the substation could do so much for all artists across all forms, but she knows why it can't continue. Right, well, Fazrin Effendi remembered the punk rock gigs when he was a teen and the film screenings when he was a young adult before wishing Godspeed substation. And Johan Lim thanked the staff past and present for keeping the substation running. Well, the Straits Times' senior culture correspondent Ong So Fen is here to weigh in. So So Fen, disappointment, sadness, those are the common reactions that we've been seeing online. How about the arts community? How have they responded to the substation's closure? I think it wouldn't be an exaggeration to say there's actual grief at the news because a lot of people are very upset by this. And like Harianto mentioned, it's not just the arts community, it's the film and the music veterans who remember how important the substation was in the early 90s when everyone was just starting out. And I think for some people in the arts community, they were also very upset because there's actually a grassroots move to try and help to save the substation. We talk about uh, places and how it has an impact as well, right? So what is the impact of the substation, substation's uh, permanent closure on Singapore's arts scene? Well, I think that the substation has always been as much about its sy symbolic significance mm. as well as being a place for art making. Because when Hua Pao Kun started it in 1990, he's a very open-minded uh, art maker. So I think that he, the impact of his ideas created this very powerful mythos around the substation. So it was for the first 20 years, it was actually a very vibrant and very chaotic refuge for art makers of all stripes. You know, they, there were serious theatre makers, there were punk rockers, there were street artists. So that is actually a very powerful space. And I think a lot of people might think that Singapore now is very advanced, that, that the substation has lost its relevance. But I think that the substation represents a venue for experimentation. Mm. It is very important as a place where artists feel free to fail as well as to experiment. And it's also been a safe space for difficult conversations to take place. And if you are going to close that substation space, I think it will be very, very difficult to create another space with the same cultural cachet as the substation has. Right. Well, 
The substation board, it said that while uh, the National Arts Council welcomed the substation back to the venue post-renovation, it will be one of several co-tenants and will not occupy the building in its full capacity. Another contributing factor to the closure, of course, is you know COVID-19, which has made fundraising especially difficult. So, Sofan, what do you make of the reasons for the closure? I think that those are valid reasons, but I think there are other contributing factors in the past 10 decades because the programming has not been as exciting. Um, I think the marketing and the comm strategy has not kept up with the times, which might have helped the substation retain audiences and find sponsorship, which could have alleviated its current problems. But I also think that the board needs to take some responsibility for the closure as well, because announcing that it's going to close now is kind of like what I would call the nuclear option. It's kind of like blowing everything up. There is still time for the substation to consider what it's going to do because there's four months till it has to move out in July. And after it closes in July, there is still two years worth of renovations that has to happen before the substation can move back into the space, you know, in any shape or form. So I think the board hasn't considered all the options and the arts community has also started to rally around the substation. So their support could actually help the substation find new solutions rather than just close down like that. Sofan, I know you mentioned this earlier quite briefly in your previous answer, but I just have to ask again, is there a chance that the substation can restart somewhere else while still retaining its dual roles as an incubator for the arts as well as a venue for indie bands to perform? I think Pao Kun himself said that there is no reason why the substation should be tied to a bricks and mortar mm. building. But for me, I think that um, to a certain extent, uh, the substation, if it moves out of that building, is kind of like an amputation because it's so tight to that space. I, but I also think that there are other solutions. The substation could move to like a warehouse space or create black box uh, spaces elsewhere. But to me, at least, I've grown up with the substation, so I think that that space has a kind of a power to it. Mm. And I think it's also ironic that Singapore, uh, now that the National Arts Council says that, oh, they're very fond of boasting that Singapore has got so many arts events throughout the year and that we are a thriving arts uh, scene, but we can't even save one tiny space in the heart of the civic district, which holds so much memories and heritage for the art scene. Oh, great points there, Sofen. Thank you so much for your time today. We've been speaking to our colleague, Ong Sofen, a senior culture correspondent at The Straits Times. Well, for more news and videos, do visit straitstimes.com and subscribe to our YouTube channel by hitting the red button below. Once again, I'm Harianto Diman with Olivia Kuei. Join us tomorrow for more stories on The Big Story.